Hi, and welcome back to David Pattinson's Accused Friends podcast format. I wanted to speak today about lockdown three and the end of free speech. And like lockdown two, lockdown three was was almost a sort of an inevitability, like a fait accompli. With lockdown two, we had this sort of build up of the tears, T-I-E-R-S, and we had, um, you know, there was sort of half the country in, in high tears, and then it was three quarters of the country in high tears, and then it was nine tenths of the country in high tears, and then it was sort of locked down to in all but name, and then it was locked down to in name. And uh, Boris Johnson came out and said, Yeah, we're going to have lockdown two. This was back in November. And then we kind of repeated the process over Christmas. First, it was going to be Christmas is you know, open, you can have Christmas, then it was like, you can't have Christmas, then it was all the tears, and instead of it being tears one, two, and three, it was tears four, five, and six, it was lockdown three in all but name, and then it was lockdown three in name, and I think it's pretty interesting, Um, it's almost like a sort of a a military operation against the British people. It's a psychops. It's a kind of a give you a bit of hope and then dash your hopes and then give you a bit of hope and then dash your hopes in terms of um, civil liberties. We'll give you a bit of freedom and then we'll cancel your freedom and then we'll give you a bit more freedom and, and then we'll cancel it. And of course, it always goes back to my original point that the government does not have the authority to violate British civil liberties They are in violation of the law. They need to be prosecuted for violations of British civil liberties. This is tyranny um, in in name. It is not tyranny in all but name. This is how tyrannical governments operate. They don't respect the uh, checks and balances and backstops on their authority. They ride right over them. They terrorize uh, the people. And um, we're getting a great example of it now in the United Kingdom. Um, I wanted to tell you that I've been doing some work recently um, improving personal security and property security. And I've been looking at into these home security systems. And they've got these some great things these days uh, using technology um, related to alerts. You know, if someone breaks into your property, Uh, whether it's uh, uh, breaking the glass or or motion sensors or door sensors or cameras, you know, uh, you can get an alert and the police can get an alert and um, family members can get an alert. And there's all these alerts and, uh, you know, they're all very, very precise. Um, It's a great way to protect your, 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 your property. And I was thinking about this from the point of view of the English Civil Liberties Trust. As you remember, This is the group that is supposed to be the sort of um, exemplars and um, the the guardians of British civil liberties. And when civil liberties were being totally violated uh, from last March onwards, these people were were fast asleep at the switch. They were were doing their, their Easter vacations and then their summer vacations and they were, you know, going on retreats. And uh, they did not notice that British civil liberties were being so heinously violated. They were doing tweets about, you know, helping some, some immigrants from Somalia get uh, get a passport or something like that. Meanwhile, 70 million British citizens were under unlawful house arrest. And I just thought about this um, home security concept. Maybe we could have a system put in the English Civil Liberties Trust offices where, you know, the second uh, civil liberties are violated by the government, you know, alert systems go off in their office, alarm systems go off. Maybe you could put one of those red flashing lights on the roof so that, you know, the moment civil liberties are being violated, everyone's getting an alert, you know, because we can't count on these people just to kind of read the news and notice that civil liberties are being violated en masse. They need some sort of electronic, um, you know, alert system or flashing lights or something dramatic. And of course, the argument against this point I'm making is that these alerts would be going off 24 hours a day. They'd be going off so often, the people working in the office there, you know, would probably have some sort of breakdown because of all the noise, because of all the flashing lights. It's not just like they'd flash, you know, kind of once 
in a blue mood. I mean, the, the level of violations of British civil liberties by the government is so egregious these days, I can't imagine there'd ever be a moment where these alert systems could ever be switched off, that they'd just be going off all the time. I wanted to make a point about Nigel Farage. He's been coming out with this uh, bromance with Tony Blair, saying Tony Blair's a great guy, we need Tony Blair involved in, in the vaccine rollout, and I can't imagine anything worse for British civil liberties than, than bringing Tony Blair into the fold. There's been um, some reports about how Tony Blair's advising uh, Matt Hancock about how to keep people healthy because, you know, Tony Blair's this great expert on, on health of the people. And, uh, you know, if you think about organizations or families or groups, there's often uh, times where there's some sort of cancerous element or dysfunctional element trying to undermine the group, trying to undermine the um, the organisation. And I think for, for British politics, Tony Blair is that figure. He's like a sort of a cancer out there on the periphery and he's always trying to, trying to be involved and wants to sort of quote unquote help um, you know, offer experience, and of course, uh, to his personal gain, but to the detriment of the entire British people. I mean, Tony Blair's legacy is, you know, importing terror from the Middle East into the British government. I mean, Middle Eastern terrorists now, I mean, talk about putting them out of business. The, the British people were told we need to put terrorists out of business so that we would have no terror. But of course, not only do we have no terror, we have more terror than ever before. But instead of it being perpetuated on us by organizations in the Middle East, it is now perpetuated on us by the British government, by the British media, by all the fear-mongering members of the establishment. And it does strike me that Nigel Farage, who, you know, no one has more respect for him than I do, his judgment and his instincts have been extremely poor through this crisis. I mean, I was on top of the violation of British civil liberties, um, you know, back last March. And uh, when I was calling for the citizens' prosecution, Nigel Farage, meanwhile, was, was sailing around the English Channel. He was talking about how face masks, uh, it was inevitable that they would become compulsory rather than speaking out against the compulsory nature, against the coercive nature of face masks. And uh, now he's saying, you know, in January, nine months after the lockdowns began, that he doesn't want to live in East Germany. But I mean, where was Nigel back last March? Where was Nigel back last April? Uh, now he thinks Tony Blair's the solution to the problem. So I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but it does strike me that Nigel's instincts related to civil liberties are not what they should be. And, uh, you know, I think Nigel's got a, lot, a hell of a lot to offer, um, you know, anti-establishment figure. But I mean, if you're going to be an anti-establishment figure, you've got to understand that uh, propping up or growing the establishment is not the solution to our problems. We need to reduce the size of government. We need to reduce the um, tyrannical nature of government. We need to have a widespread education program on British civil liberties, and we need to have a citizen's prosecution of the government for any and all violations of civil liberties as and when they occur not, you know, months and years later when people finally realise, hey, civil liberties are being violated. I mean, we've got people like Steve Baker, who never saw a lockdown bill he didn't immediately jump in and vote for with the crocodile tears. Meanwhile, he's out there saying, yeah, lockdown's a bad thing, but as everyone knows, give him a lockdown bill to vote for, he'll be the first one in line. And, uh, you know, this uh, this Tony Blair stuff, I mean, it's this it's really about the ex-Prime Minister fraud. I mean, these people, their Prime Minister, they're accountable to the people, and then when they're ex-Prime Ministers, 
they feed off that perception that people still see them as fighting for the people's interest, when really they're fighting for their own interest, they're fighting for their financial interest. We have a lot of prime ministers these days that look seek to make decisions in number 10 Downing Street that will help enrich them when they leave 10 Downing Street. And, uh, you know, we really want to have a, a big moratorium on people after they leave government, they are no longer permitted to work with government. They are no longer permitted to work in government. They need to return to the private sector so that while they are in office, they are not making decisions that are focused solely on enriching them, focused solely on enriching their family, focused solely on enriching them, um, their friends, and focused solely on stealing taxpayer money through rackets like foreign aid and global warming. I wanted to move on and talk about free speech. And people would have seen in the news that Donald Trump had his uh, social media accounts all cancelled um, a couple of nights ago. And uh, I suppose on the one hand, you'd say this is totally un unbelievable. And uh, on the other hand, you'd say this was entirely predictable because we're, we're living in an era where civil liberties are being violated. And so free speech inevitably is going to be censored and cancelled and it's part of cancel culture. I mean if you think about lockdown from an abstract point of view it is a form of cancel culture. You're you're not seeing people anymore. They're in their home. If they come out they've got to have a face mask on. Um, you can't really, really see their emotions. You they, uh, they have to lose their job. They have to kind of disappear also, if you're someone that speaks out against this, uh, like an anti-lockdown person, you know, you have to be uh, branded as a bad person. There were some stories in the news about how, um, you know, anti-vaccination people are going to have to be prosecuted. Um, I can only imagine it's a matter of time before anti-lockdown people are going to have to be prosecuted. And of course, if you look at that from a legal point of view, you know, if being an anti-vaxxer is a criminal offence, surely being a pro-vaxxer is is equally an offence because it's it's an opinion. I mean, who among us decides what opinions are correct, uh, what opinions are not correct? Is it the elected, uh, in the US example, the elected uh, president of the United States, or is it the unelected um, board of directors at Twitter? Is it the unelected board of directors at Facebook? You know, who among us is the authority? And, um, you know, it's a, it's a shame that, that free speech has to be attacked. Um, it's, a, it's a shame that, um, you know, more and more people uh, aren't standing up against the violations of British civil liberties. Because, of course, if they can cancel Donald Trump's free speech, how long is it going to be before they cancel yours? How long is it going to be before they cancel mine? I would say probably not very long. So lockdown three, I'll, uh, I'll end on this. And I want to talk about, you know, the similarities between lockdown three and lockdowns one and two. And I think lockdown three is very, very similar to lockdown one. It's a similar length of time, um, you know, a few months. Uh, there's maybe a few weeks, maybe a few months. <coughs> Excuse me. There's much stricter police enforcement. You know, you can't have um, you can't have an ice cream. You can have a flask, but if it has hot water, you get a prosecution. If it has cold water, you don't. There's police breaking into people's houses. There's uh, no doubt there'll be some drones showing up, and maybe that Neil Ardley officer from Northampton will come out again talking about exterminating people. And, um, you know, it's bully boy tactics from the police. And, of course, this is a little bit of a... It's a deliberate tactic. What happens at these lockdowns uh, now, clearly there's a pattern. You get the police overzealous nature. Then you get the government coming out saying, yeah, yeah, we didn't really want the police doing this. They need to sort of pull back. Uh, reminds me of my rugby days. You know, my coaches used to say, look, David, as soon as the game starts, make sure you put you knock your opponent down hard as you can right in the very first minute so they'll spend the rest of the game hoping they don't get the ball, hoping they don't get another whack from you. Um, you know, they don't want to repeat, repeat that pain for the rest of the game. It puts the opponent off 
the um, their game because they're worried about the uh, the harm you might cause them. And of course, you know, if you don't do this to them, they'll do it to you. And it, it's what happens with these lockdown. The lockdown begins. The police come out with the overzealous nature, totally violating um, the um, civil liberties related to. Um, you know, unlawful searches and seizures, uh, warrantless um, searches and seizures without probable cause, um, you know, fining people, uh, announcing fines, announcing prosecutions, which may or may not be found guilty in court. They probably won't. Uh, well, they probably will. Who knows? Uh, in a guilty until proven innocent society. And then the government ministers like Priti Patel, who's not attractive, come in and say, oh yeah, yeah, we didn't mean this. This is overzealous nature from the police. But of course, the damage is done. The terror has been inflicted on the people. The um, the, the brass knuckles have been shown. So um, it doesn't matter after that if, if the police pull back, the message has been sent. And of course, lockdown, it's happening in lockdown one, it's happening in lockdown three. Lockdown two, we didn't really see this. I remember speaking to someone during lockdown two and I, they said like, you know, um, they were talking to someone about going out the following week and the other person said like, oh, isn't it lockdown? And they said, oh yeah, I didn't realize that. I forgot we were in lockdown. And um, you know, they, they suggested to me that they should rebrand lockdown two as lockdown light because it wasn't really uh, as tough a lockdown as lockdown one not as tough a lockdown as lockdown three. And I think a hundred years ago from now, when students uh, are looking into the how the lockdowns of our country begin, probably be into the lockdown uh, three figures by then, at least maybe four figures, but um, they'll be looking at this saying, yeah, lockdown two, that was like the glory days. That was like the halcyon days, lockdown light. Uh, that was the softest uh, lockdown, you know, we've had or we had at the time. Uh, so, yeah, I think there needs to be a special recognition of the uh, the freedom of lockdown two, lockdown light, uh, which we are not seeing in lockdown uh, three, uh, which we, we didn't really see in lockdown one. Of course, during lockdown one, there was a lot of people that were fearful of the virus itself. In lockdown three, uh, very, very few people fearful of the virus, but very, very uh, significantly fearful of the government. Uh, shows the, the level of mistrust there is from the government to the people because it's the coercive nature of everything. If, if people were, if there was a genuine threat to life from the virus, people would be happy to lock themselves down. If there was a recognition that masks were effective, people would be happy to wear them but of course the government know there isn't and the people know there isn't that's why there has to be excuse me the coercive nature the forced nature the enforced nature because um you know there is not enough trust um in the people from the government and of course this then creates mistrust uh, in the government from the people there is mistrust on both sides there is discontent on both sides and this is exactly the consequence of violating British civil liberties, which should never happen. I notice, um, finally, that there seems to be a pattern of furloughs and bailouts ending in Britain and in other European countries on March the 31st um, or around April 1st. There seems to be this kind of coordination that the um, furloughs need to end at that time. <coughs> Excuse me. Presumably the virus is going to end on March 31st as well. All these daily deaths, which um, are not actually daily deaths. I mean, the daily deaths in Britain are a, collate, uh, a collation of deaths from about the last 30 to 60 days, which have finally made it into the official figures for that day, something that's not really ever reported. The other thing about the daily deaths, it's never clear whether the people died from the coronavirus or directly of the coronavirus that's never made clear but i'm wondering aloud if the coronavirus will sort of be announced as strongly under control um on or around april 1st uh lockdowns will end on or around april 1st across europe 
um, bailouts will end uh, around that time as well, and the economic collapse will commence around that time. Be interested in people's thoughts on that. If there's a, a strong pattern they're noticing between all these um, furloughs across Europe, and of course, um, you know, if the virus is so predictable. Why doesn't someone come out and tell us? I mean, why is it that March 31st is that date? It's a bit like these curfews. The virus, um, you know, it's not around in the daytime, but, you know, you get to 6 p.m. or you get to 10 p.m., the virus is coming straight out at nighttime. The virus is coming straight out as or is ending, sorry, as soon as we get to April 1st. Uh, it's not going to end February 1st, not going to end March 1st, it's going to end on April 1st. How do people know this? How is this a virus that is so unpredictable to some, yet so incredibly predictable to others? Uh, maybe it's just a case of, of following the science. Anyway, I hope you, uh, you like this video and, and it's provided some food for thought for you. Please subscribe to the channel. Look forward to chatting with you again soon.